Good afternoon. I'm Mark Greenfield. As chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I would like to welcome you to the first in our 1969-1970 noon lecture series. Today's speaker has been the subject of much attention in the last few weeks. Angela Davis, a former member of the Black Panthers and SNCC, is presently a member of the Che Lumumba Club, an all-black collective of the Communist Party. She is currently completing her doctoral dissertation under, under the direction of Herbert Marcusa and is an acting assistant professor of philosophy at UCLA. Last Friday, the regents of the University of California voted to suspend Ms. Davis from her teaching duties, and it is in this regard that she is here today. I introduce to you Professor Angela Davis. Thank you. The signs of a conspiracy are cropping up. A conspiracy whose present goal appears to be the destruction of the very possibility of education in the state. Marvin X, a professor at Fresno State College, is on the verge of losing his job because he believes in the construction of a black nation. 24 black students are on trial for almost 2,000 felony charges for having attempted to protest the existence of racism at San Fernando Valley State College. Saul Castro and two black teachers are being transferred to all white schools because they sympathize with the demands of the students to make education relevant to the community. And I'd just like to add, if I hadn't been in my class on Monday, if I hadn't had to lecture, I think I would have been right down on the picket line supporting Saul Castro. <laughs> the regents have fired me because they say I'm a member of the Communist Party. Now, those involved in the conspiracy seem to be either ignorant or outright disdainful of the very process of education. Perhaps they simply haven't had the time with all of their activities and the banks and the corporations to sit down and ask themselves, what is the meaning of education? Now, I want to take a little time out today and discuss that. And I hope it reaches them. Everything else I've said, they seem to somehow have found out about. So I hope they'll listen to this. Now, I think the goal of the educational process is to create human beings who have human concerns, human beings who know and understand themselves, and are able to pass human judgments on what's going on around them. Education should not mold the mind according to a prefabricated architectural plan. It should rather liberate the mind. It should liberate the mind from established definitions and plans. The mind has to be liberated merely in order to perceive the world, to see the society, to understand what its advantages are, what its disadvantages are. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between political ideas and opinions on the one hand and the educational process on the other. I've been asked over and over again, how can you really be committed to the struggle for liberation and leave your ideas outside of the classroom, leave your political opinions outside of the classroom? Now, I maintain that political opinions should be brought into the classroom. They belong in the classroom. I think that education itself is inherently political. Its goal ought to be political. It ought to create human beings who possess a genuine concern for their fellow human beings and who will, who will use the knowledge they acquire in order to conquer nature, but to conquer nature for the purpose of freeing man, of freeing man from enslaving necessities. But I'd like to leave this for a moment and talk a little bit about another kind of politicalization of education. The university has become 
political in a very overt sense. It's become political as far as politics are defined by the controlling political apparatus in this country. No one, I don't think, can deny the fact that universities continually receive research grants from the government which are directly related to defense. Research grants which force the scholar to develop more efficient means of, for example, furthering the war in Vietnam. This is a politicalization of the university. We've had to put up a very hard and long struggle, and we continue to wage that struggle, just in order to bring more black and Chicano students and faculty into the university. The fact that a few years ago, there were very, very few blacks and Chicanos on the campus, I think points to the fact that the university is political. It was political in its very acceptance of the racism which exists in this society. Now, perhaps this isn't the outright assertion that black and brown people are inferior to whites and for this reason shouldn't be allowed to enter into the sacred doors of education. Now, the kind of racism that's at work in the educational system is far less overt, but it's far more harmful. It's far more harmful because of the difficulty we have in pinpointing it. Now, how does institutional racism, and this is institutional racism we're talking about, affect the university? Now, I think there's certain requirements and standards which are supposedly maintained by the university. I don't know, what, what is it? You have to get a B average in order to be accepted, and you have to have certain uh, academic courses during your high school years in order to be brought into the university. Now, at first, this kind of a requirement seems to be completely neutral. But let's put it into the context of what's happening in, in high schools, which are predominantly black and brown, and let's analyze it there. Some research work was done by some friends of mine in San Diego, where in high schools, where the student population is predominantly black or brown. Now, first of all, what they found was that students there were continually encouraged to take vocational programs and not to enter into the academic uh, courses. They were told that they'd never get to college anyway, so why waste their time working in an academic course of study when they really ought to be preparing themselves to go out and get a job when they finished high school? Now, this isn't even to mention the quality of the education which black and brown students get in this state, in this society. Now, what was the result of this research that I'm talking about. They found that the black and brown students who, according to the standards and requirements of the University of California, that only about 3%, 3%, and I think actually the number was smaller than that, were actually qualified, quote, qualified enough even in order to be considered by the admissions office for admission into the university. Now, the number of students who actually get in, that's another question. And then we talk about establishing new standards. We talk about things like potential rather than actual achievement because the occasion for actual achievement has not yet been created in this country, in the high schools and the ghettos. Now, when we say that we want to establish new standards, a lot of people in the university cry out and say that this is an institution for the elite. This is, in, this is an institution designed to create the future leaders of our society. Therefore, we can't afford to lower our standards. Nobody had ever said anything about lowering standards. They interpret new standards as a lowering of their standards. Now, this is what institutional racism is. This is a kind of racism that's not immediately visible. This is a kind of racism that we have to fight. This is a kind of politicalization of the university which has to be neutralized. Now, just about a week ago, right here in Los Angeles, some really tragic results of a, of a survey were released 
And the results were that students in the Los Angeles ghetto schools cannot read. They are far below the average norm. Now, this is a part of the conspiracy that I'm talking about. When these students reach college, they will have been totally eliminated from those who are qualified to attend the university. And of course, the reason for refusing them entrance won't be because they're black or brown, but because they aren't qualified. Because, according to the neutral statement, that they have to satisfy certain qualifications, certain requirements, certain standards, they will not be allowed to participate in the so-called sacred activities of education. Now, you know, maybe things like high potential programs can be set up, but we have to understand that this does not attack the root of the problem. And I'm not trying to put down the high potential program. I think it's very good, but the fact is that it accepts the existence of racism. It accepts this kind of institutional racism, and it tries to work within that framework. It's not going to attack the conspiracy against education. Now, I said a little earlier that I think that education ought to be political, that it's inherently political in another sense, not in the way that I've outlined the negative political nature of the university in this day and age. Now, I want to read a quote from Herbert Marcuse's latest book, An Essay on Liberation, and I think he puts it very well. He says, what appears as extraneous politicalization of the university by disrupting radicals today, is today rather, as it was so often in the past, the logical internal dynamic of education. Translation of knowledge into reality, of humanistic values into humane conditions of existence. Denial of the right of political activity in the university perpetuates the separation between theoretical and practical reason and reduces the effectiveness and the scope of intelligence. Those people who don't understand these internal dynamics of the educational process maintain, as I stated earlier, that political opinions ought to be kept out of the classroom. Of course, totally ignoring that there are political opinions already in the classroom, but they're political opinions which reflect the political power in this country. Now, in maintaining that the university is no place for political thought, they are denying something which is the most crucial aspect of knowledge, its transformation into reality. Now, when I've made this statement before, people have accused me of being utilitarian, pragmatic. There exists, they say, and there ought to exist an impetus towards knowledge for the sake of knowledge. The unadulterated pursuit of knowledge is what they're talking about. Now, of course, knowledge has to be capable of transcending mere material necessity it, ha it ought to be capable of transcending the present political and economic situation. But for what? Should knowledge be cooped up in a vacuum which is unrelated to human reality? My position is that knowledge has to transcend the immediate political reality for one purpose, for the purpose of transforming it, for the purpose of setting the stage for the elimination of human suffering and misery for the abolition of racism, for the creation of a society which reflects the interests of the people who constitute that society. And I suppose this was why the regents fired me. They intend to keep the knowledge developed in the university in the service of the prevailing oppression. And I guess they were right from their point of view. The fact that I'm a member of the Communist Party, that I'm involved, in the activities of the Chela Mumba Club, which is an all-black collective of the party committed to the struggle for black liberation, says something about the kind of mind that I have. I can't and I won't keep my political opinions out of the classroom. I think they belong there. Now, I've come to the conclusion that the elimination of racism, human suffering, can only come about through socialism. Since knowledge should provide answers to these problems, I feel that I have every right when the occasion presents itself, that is when it's relevant to what's at hand, to say to my students, 
I have given these things a lot of thought. My conclusion is that only some form of communism is going to solve our basic human problems. And I want them to think about it, to criticize, to say what they think, to say whether they think I'm wrong, to say whether they think I, I'm right, and to present other solutions, perhaps, which they feel might be better. Now, this is the process of education. It's, a free, it's supposed to be a free atmosphere where everything can be subjective, can be subjected to a critical attitude. And I think the critical attitude is truly the mark of an educated person. But I have to inject here the fact that this is not really what the regents meant when they said that my membership in the Communist Party makes me biased and renders me incapable of teaching in the true sense. So when I said they were right, that my membership in the Communist Party says something about the kind of mind I have, I didn't mean, and I want to make this clear, especially to the members of the press who are here, that I received directives from the party as to how to conduct my class, or that my mind has been rigidified by my experiences in, in the party, that I would be incapable of free thought. You know, I just realized that I ought to uh, point this out because some people might say, yeah, well, she concedes that she has ideological prejudices and therefore, you know, would not be a good teacher. Now, I don't know, perhaps I would be overestimating the intelligence of the regents if I expected them to understand what I've been trying to say today, to understand... <laughs> to understand you know, what the inherent relationship between education and politics is. Now, I said not too long ago that their decision to fire me pointed to the existence of racism in the society. And they proved themselves, I think, totally incapable of understanding that there's more to racism than just psychological attitudes. I think you know, I've demonstrated that on one level that there is something that we can call institutional racism and that ex exists in the university. Now, one of the regents, without even taking the time to think about what I had said, jumped up and said, we didn't fire her because she's black. We fired her because she's a member of the Communist Party. And to demonstrate that, we're going to find another black person to replace her with once she leaves. Now, I think anyone who was so in unintelligent so unintelligent to make a statement like that does not deserve to determine in any way or form what kind of education thousands of young people are getting in this state. <laughs> Yet the regents, the regents, they are the ones who have all the power in the universities. In the end, they determine what you, the students, can learn, what you, the faculty, can teach. And I reject their immoral usurpation of power, which rightly belongs to those who have the knowledge and the experience to pass rational, rational judgments about the way in which education ought to be carried out. Now, the regents are supposed to represent the people of California. That's what the Constitution of the State of California says. It says that they're, su they're supposed to be appointed without regard to any sectarian reasons. They're supposed to represent the people. Now, I think we ought to ask ourselves, do we see ourselves represented there, or are we not people? Now, a friend of mine has been doing some research on the Constitution of the Board of Regents from the point you know, when it was actually formed. And she's found that since 1946, and this is as far as she's gotten, I think we can say since 1869 or whenever the regents were constituted, that since 1946, not one black person, not one Chicano, not one Oriental, not one Indian has been appointed to the Board of Regents. Only about three women have had positions. I think women are people in this society. And very few Catholics have been there. Now, the Board of Regents has continued to exhibit sectarian characteristics, and this is a direct violation of the trust which was vested in them. Now, we should ask ourselves, who do they represent? Who do the Board of Regents really represent? Now, I think the banks have a very good representation on the Board of Regents. 
like Band Corporation, which owns controlling shares in a lot of the banks in California, is very well represented on the Board of Regents. The monopolies in this country are represented. The prevailing political parties are there. That's where the representation is. But where, where, where is the black community? Where is the Chicano community? Where is the Oriental community, the Indian community, the students, the women, the faculty? Where are they? The regents, I think, have illegally established a tyranny over the University of California. And if we do not assert our legal and our moral right to the power which they unlawfully took away from us, that tyranny is going to become worse and worse. Now, faculty members at this point don't even have the ultimate decision over who their colleagues will be. The regents have taken back the power to veto tenure appointments and promotions. They felt very uncomfortable to see Herbert Marcuse educating, and I mean educating, the students at UCSD, teaching them that knowledge, in order to be knowledge, has to be relevant to human reality. Because they felt uncomfortable, because they felt afraid, I think. They passed a resolution saying that Marcuse was too old to teach. And Marcuse is one of the youngest and the most refreshing human beings that I've ever met. I think that was absolutely no reason at all. Now, the regents took away the power from the campuses of deciding who's going to teach experimental courses, who and how many times guests can lecture at this university. They were afraid of Eldridge Cleaver. The regents, alleged represent representatives of the people of California, allowed the police force and the military to prevent those people who they're supposed to be representing from making use of the property which belongs to them. They killed, they brutalized, they murdered human beings who had more than a right, I think, to establish a park for the people on the land which rightfully belongs to the people. The regents are afraid of the people. I think we have to make that clear. They are afraid of the people. And we have to demonstrate to them here and now that they have every right to be afraid. They should be afraid because we aren't going to put up with that nonsense anymore. We aren't going to put up with their nonsense, with their irrationality, with their murder any longer. We have to show them that they have every right to be afraid. Now, they don't realize it, but every single step they take, every action they take, is proof of this irrationality, their immorality. They are exposing themselves. All we have to do is recount the facts, and it becomes very evident exactly what they're trying to do. Now, I think it's very revealing that I, along with the Communist Party and the philosophy department on this campus, have been accused of staging this whole story in order to create unrest on the campuses. We conspired to have the information about my membership in the Communist Party leak out, and then we staged the whole scenario from then on. Now, apparently, that means that we conspire to have Bill Diwali, an FBI informer, write the article in the Daily Brewing alleging that I'm a member of the Communist Party. That brings the FBI into the conspiracy. <laughs> apparently, we conspire to have Ed Montgomery, who is, I think, perhaps the most reactionary reporter in the state, write an article in the San Francisco Examiner stating that I was a communist, or rather, he said a Maoist, you know, a Black Panther, a member of SDS. We conspired to have the regents instruct the administration to send me a letter asking me whether or not I'm a member of the Communist Party. That puts the regents and the administration into the conspiracy, I think. Now, I think we have to ask ourselves, who do the facts indict? Who really staged the scenario? And I think it's perfectly clear who the conspirators are. I think it's perfectly clear who's conspiring against the people who are rightfully determined to remain human beings. Now, I've been talking primarily about Regan and the Regents, and I've limited you know, these observations to the educational system in this, in this state. 
I think it's very important to point to these real, concrete, immediate issues. But at the same time, we can't forget that the region's action is an exceptional flaw in a society which is other otherwise beautiful. They are not isolated in their acts of repression. They have rather become the accomplices, the accomplices in a conscious effort to subject people in the society who are standing up to demand change. They are subjecting these people to the most brutal forms of physical and mental repression. They are obviously, they are obviously accomplices in the attempt to deny Eldridge Cleaver his right to have a platform on which to express his views in this society. They were directly involved in having him forced into exile. The calculated genocide of the ranks of the Black Panther Party, I think, is the most extreme form of the repression which is coming down in this society and of the repression of which the, in, of which the regents are but one of the instruments. The people who are on trial in Chicago for conspiracy as a result of the attempt to lawfully conduct a protest demonstration at the Chicago Democratic Convention, they are also one of the most obvious targets of the repression. Now, a milder form of this repression was exhibited when United Airlines, not too long ago, fired a black stewardess because she refused to cut down her natural. Now, by the way, speaking of naturals, I, I received countless letters which have informed me that the real reason I have no right to teach in the University of California is because of my hairstyle. <laughs> One woman put it, you know, a person who looks like the heathens in, in the Fiji Islands has no place teaching our pure young students in California. <laughs> You know, now I think that the fact that I am a member of the Chela Mumba Club of the Communist Party, the fact that I'm a black communist is very symbolic in this case. As a communist, I have to demand radical change. I see that capitalism does not possess the flexibility to allow for the solution of the basic problems which confront us today. Exploitation of workers, super exploitation of black and brown workers, which means high rates of unemployment in our community, and thus bad housing, atrocious living conditions, bad education. Now, capitalism, of course, can allow for a little tokenism. The government, as it is shown, can subsidize a few people in the black community and call that black capitalism, but they can't create jobs for our people. And they're resorting to fascist techniques more and more the fascist techniques of suppressing our rightful demands. Now, I maintain that only under a socialist reorganization of society can we even begin to deal with these basic material problems. To say nothing of eradicating the individualistic, competitive, racist mentality of the people in this country. Only after, I feel, a redistribution of the wealth in this country only after we eradicate the exploitation of man by man can we begin to build a humane society, both for black, brown, and white people. Now, it, I think it's significant, as I said before, that the regents chose me as a target of their act, attack. And I think it's symbolic because black members of the Communist Party are far, far from being the only black people who are beginning to see that this society must be thoroughly transformed if we're going to solve these basic problems. All over the country, black people, Chicanos, white people, everybody, I think, is waking up to this. And those in power are really afraid. They're afraid because they realize, and they know very well, that only revolutionary change is going to help the masses of the people in this country. Now, in speaking of repression, I think one of the most violent forms of repression which exists in this society today is the calculated indoctrination to which the American people are being subjected. And I think that the many hate letters that I've received during the last weeks indicate that. The most extreme letter I got in the mail yesterday, and that letter said, it's time to 
Bring out the ovens. It's time to load the ovens. It's time to exterminate niggers and communists. Now see, you might say that something as crazy, as fanatic as that is irrelevant, because that's the exception. But what we have to remember is that not too long ago, it wasn't fanatic in the South to say one was going to lynch a black man. And I've, I know that you've heard this over and over and over again, but I don't think we can stop pointing to the fact that recent history in this country has been marred by political assassinations. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Bobby Hutton, and I could go on and on and on and on. Now even though such a letter as that might be the exception now, there may not be a whole lot of people who would talk about loading up the ovens. But it may very well not be the exception in the future, and this is what we have to watch out for. We have to ask ourselves, how did Nazism emerge in Germany? We have to learn from history. If only for the purpose of avoiding past errors, we have to learn how not to reduplicate the brutality of past history. Now, I've resolved to fight this repression, and I made up my mind a long time ago, and I know that a lot of you feel this fight is very important, but of course, you know, you have to get good grades, you have to do a lot of studying, your faculty members have research projects which are very important. You know, I myself was supposed to have my PhD dissertation finished by the end of this quarter, but obviously, you know, that's not going to be the case. And I think we have to establish some priorities. We have to ask ourselves whether we're going to make an effort now towards individual fulfillment or whether we're going to wage a fight for a more humane society, whether we're going to create a strong defensive against what may very well become an era of fascism. You see, I don't think we really have a choice. I don't think there is any question about what the priority should be. I think the priority is very clear. Because, and this is the last thing I want to say, because if we don't work to prevent the full-blown development of fascism in this country, then we won't even be able to talk about, we won't even be able to talk about individual fulfillment in the future. Thank you very much.